All right. Well, officially, bonjour tout le monde. Welcome everyone on Zoom, YouTube, and in person to Concordia University's fourth space. So glad you could join us for While the Animated City Still Breathes, a workshop and conversation event. Now that you're settling in, folks, I'd like to remind you that we are streaming to YouTube Live from Four Space, which is located on unceded Indigenous lands here in Jogge, Montreal. And we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Kenyankahaga Nation, who are the caretakers for the lands and waters we're meeting on for their teachings about the earth and our relations. At Fourth Space, we work with our university community to mobilize and exchange knowledge by co-creating daily activities. And importantly, we also have the pleasure of helping to activate the work of Concordia Public Scholars. And today, Aristophanes Silikas, I'm sorry, Silikas, doctoral candidate in the individualized program, INDI, as it's known here at Concordia, will lead us through a workshop in the first half, followed by a conversation with special guest Janet Blatter, who's come in here in person to join uh, Ari for this conversation that will in part tackle some ideas related to sensing and communicating space and place via animation. Before passing it to Ari, last thing I'll just say, if you'd like to jump into the conversation uh, at any point, in the second half or even during the workshop if you're on zoom you're more than welcome to turn on your camera raise a hand and just speak we'll be able to see you and hear you in the space and during the q a um, during the conversation as well otherwise the chat is of course activated for you to use and if you're joining us in person just raise an actual hand and we'll get a microphone to you so that the folks on zoom can hear you that's it for me over to you ari welcome thank you very much anna for the invitation and for all this organization in the fourth space. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here and to share, uh, well, to, to take you to the, to the back room of uh, a lot of um, the, the, the work I do as a film animator to bring you uh, behind the scenes in my process, how I do things, and what better place than here next to Maisonneuve, where uh, the city is still breathing. And uh, the city is um, the, the, the subject matter of much of my work and preoccupation, uh, doing physical uh, animation, handmade animation that, that somehow chimes with the physicality uh, of our world. And uh, uh, we have set up, um, well, in, a, in an ad hoc maybe way, but I think it, it looks uh, great, <laughs> uh, a light table onto which uh, I'm going to invite, actually, I'm going to invite everybody who's here to come on the other side of the screen so they can come see up close because this whole workshop is all about being present <laughs> and um, just as this these uh, handmade techniques and in, in particular the the paper cut and the silhouette animation is um, a, lo a lot of it uh, has a, an element of spontaneity um, there is there's a lot of unplanned work and i'm going to invite you to help me plan <laughs> the the process. So welcome. Uh, you can come closer. And uh, well, here, first of, first of all, uh, I, I have a light table and a camera which is fixed on top. Uh, this is animation is frame by frame. Uh, I usually work with 12 frames per second. It allows me for more, more animation with less work. <laughs> Uh, but also it gives um, a, a style to, to the work, this imperfection um, element of it. Uh, and, and here, uh, you, could, you can come closer, you can come here and see. Yes, uh, feel free, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm using this software called Dragon Frame which is made for this type of uh, animation, the stop motion animation. And those who are in film may uh, be familiar with stop motion a bit uh, or, or have some experience. Um, I try to keep the involvement of technology to the minimum so I can focus and put my energy on the actual crafting and the storytelling and uh, allow the imagination to 
take over, uh, at least as far as the viewer is concerned. So uh, I focused my camera on, on the surface. I use paper surfaces to create some kind of background texture. Um, that, that's not the only thing that one can do. There's tons, but this is something that has been quite successful. As you can see uh, behind you, uh, these are some highlights from animations I've done in the past. And as you can see, this is a city that's burning and, uh, and basically that's uh, tissue, uh, uh, tissue paper that's uh, supposed to be the, uh, the smoke. <laughs> Uh, so to speak. So, so it, uh, people recognize these, these uh, elements, uh, may recognize them, but, but they, there is that suspension of disbelief that I find that it, it is very, very uh, important in, in, uh, in film. Uh, and there's a lot of suspension of disbelief <laughs> in what I do here. So um, I, I will do something that I haven't planned, but I have a, an idea of what it could be. Uh, I will do a bit of paper cut uh, work. And before I do that, um, I just want to make sure uh, of the, actually, I'll do that. Make sure of the boundaries of what I'm capturing. So, uh, am I supposed to share my screen? I guess I will. I eh? uh, share it with uh, on Zoom. So, um, share screen with. Yeah. So I hope I'm, I'm sharing the screen correctly. There's a lot of light here, so it's not going to be easy for people to see. But uh, bear with me. So here, For the sake of this workshop, I'm trying to keep it simple. So I'm, I'm just having an imaginary boundary just to know where my camera is, what is capturing. So knowing this, this size, So this is a cutting board. I've got a small one. I'm trying to work small today. Something was not expected. So let's say we have the side of a building. Maybe some kind of And what I like about the uh, <laughs> these exacto knives are that, well, 
ideally you can sketch everything precisely before cutting. But sometimes they're so they're so versatile that you can cut uh, straight if you're experienced with <laughs> sketching to the point that you can cut the way you would sketch. So I thought of doing Let's say an arched pathway. I know this is not very TV friendly, YouTube. Not sure if people can see anything, but I promise there is something for everyone here. Perfect, but let's say it's an arcade, and there's a reason why I haven't done the bottom part. Because <laughs> I'll have somebody walking, and I don't want to have to deal with the complication of a walk cycle. It's going to take, it would have taken much longer. So, um, I'm on Zoom, but I would like to see my... Ari, you can restart your screen share. Sorry, we closed it for ah, a minute. Yes. If you don't mind, sorry about that. No problem. So oh, I'm restarting, right? Yeah, the screen share. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah, so I just eyeballed it, but <laughs> it, it, uh, it looks good in terms of the space it occupies. I'm just going to fill that gap because I cut it a little bigger. And land. Yeah, it's 
fills the screen. All right. So maybe it's a good idea to fix that so it doesn't move. So masking tape. Looking at the screen, I don't see this piece of um, tape, but it could be visible, but I think we're fine. use used paper that was going to be thrown anyway Put that on so let's say there's a person Do something very general and generic. Uh, sometimes I come up with ideas while I'm cutting and I'm thinking, oh, maybe I can add this little line here, this little, you know, refine the silhouette. like a person <clears throat> there's enough space here for this person to move a little bit uh, so can people see anything yes yeah, so if I have this person walking like this yeah that that's shadow theater but I need to do animation <laughs> so We'll, we'll try to do this frame by frame. So remotely, I'm sending a signal to the camera. The camera is capturing the image without me touching the camera because that obviously would have added undesired movements, shakiness. It's shaky as it is, so you don't want more. And this is where we get into the timing. Uh, animation has a lot to do about with timing and, and um, experience gives us some intuition into how many frames uh, one needs.
you think I'm a very patient person, but I, I wasn't always a very patient person. Then you get into these passions and you have no choice. And I praise a lot the handmade and the techniques here that I'm using, but then I need to praise the technology so the technology doesn't take any revenge on me. But the thing with technology here is that one can press play and see in real time immediately right after a few frames see what one has done and I think this is the, the great I just don't find the play button here but I don't know if it's this no. uh, well if I, if I press no, there we go the, 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 the space bar so I don't quite like this movement so I can do it again because it feels as if this person is climbing upstairs and this is not what I want there is a uh, area where I could see the frames that I have captured which is the X sheet yes So I'll try once more. I'm not going to spend the whole hour doing this, but Trying now to be a bit smoother, more horizontal, but mostly a, a more linear movement up and down because as the person walks, of course, they're not walking in a horizontal line. And then you, you think about walking You know, you walk yourself. Uh, there is a little bit of a delay when, when, when I'm up. That means I will have to have more frames in that, that period where, when I'm up, just to make it a little bit more natural. So that means... Come back. This is the current frame, so I haven't moved it yet. I'm moving it now. Oh, no. If I play, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let's say it's better. And then down again. can always press and see what, where the animation, the preceding animation leads me. In the column.
So I noticed that I was, when I first did the, the, the first take, um, I was, I was uh, taking too many frames. So he was going a bit too slow for his size in this, this scale. Mm -hmm. And No, I'll do something funny. I just decided to do that. Speaking outside the column. <laughs> A few frames that are still. Six frames is half a second. Then an abrupt movement. Let's see how that looks. Yeah. So that's just a little snippet of uh, a silhouette type of animation, how simple it can be, how fun it could be, um, and um, how communicative it could be without much detail or so-called realism. Um, and, and of course, I spend time, and you can spend much more time and love in making these uh, backgrounds and have many layers and colors and uh, there, there are possibilities. Uh, so th these are the tools, they're very simple and uh, in, you can add, one can add uh, things that are, that, are, that are captured by the camera. So there's nothing extra in terms of the technology, it's just that the things that one creates with uh, one's own hands uh, can, can, can take you to other heights. So uh, this was just one part of what I can show today. Uh, we still have 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I, I, yeah, animation is time consuming. So I had a lot of things in mind, but I can do this one thing. So here it will be more reliant on not on the uh, underlit on the, the the light underneath, but more on the existing light. Since this is not a silhouette, it's just a a drawing of a street. And we'll see how that looks.
even though there's light underneath, uh, the light above is sufficient, it seems. So I have an idea. Um, I have a glass. I have also this, which is transparent. If I wanted to have a, uh, a distance between the layers, I would obviously use this piece of glass uh, on a higher level. And you can have different types of movements and even parallax movements when we would say we move and we have the objects that are close to us moving faster than the objects that are behind. Uh, get complicated, but there are light tables at the Mill Hoppenheim School where I studied uh, animation where there are a mechanism with which you can move the surfaces in very regular intervals. This is not possible with, with this or even with what I have at home, so there's a lot of uh, trial and error. But here, I think this would do. Now, why am I doing, uh, well, to protect the drawing mostly, Thank you. So let's see uh, if I could do drawings on top of the transparency. Yeah, so here, because of the glass, there is a bit of a reflection. It's not a good idea, the glass. This will suffice. So I'm going to take this off. Some charcoals. Use a pencil, but So I can have something moving in front of this streetscape. Uh, I can have a car, I can have a bird, I can have a balloon. Um, let's say I have a, a bird. three instances.
And this is a way also to see what the previous frame contained uh, by using the so-called onion skin. So one can see, be, juxtapose the, the two last frames uh, here, I think, yeah. So here you can see the first instance and here you see the next one. It looks about right. You can have that same position. Mm. And then a third position. Again. And when the bird lowers the, the wings, of course, it abruptly goes higher a little bit. So there, we'd have that. and even higher. Why not? Yes. And off it goes on the screen. Okay, so it's it's uh, joined with the previous one, so we'll see that. But now, yeah, there's the bird. So it's quite quick. Of course, it's done with uh, pieces of paper that are seen, but you can see the bird flying through the city. And you can imagine how many other things you can do by just having uh, transparencies juxtaposed.
Um, I can invite volunteers if anybody wants to do something um, with with uh, just transparencies. Sketch anything you want. Uh, have three instances of something. Just just a, it could be abstract. It could be just a, a sense of a place that uh, you'd like to to evoke. <laughs> Does anybody have the urge? Well, I'll start and you'll see what I'm doing here. Because there's something also very plastic about this type of art, meaning that it's just like clay and, uh, well, Paper cuts are not as plastic, but, but then charcoal is much more. You can mold it as you draw. Here, I know it's smaller than the actual screen, doesn't matter. So let's suppose, I know it's all windows and arches today, but they're convenient. They're almost like a, a frame in themselves. Let's say it's we're looking through a window outside. blow it because I'm going to make a mess and there's let's do something urban but I don't know dramatic there's uh, there's other buildings that we see something like that and then there's chimneys. You know where I'm getting at. And there's something else going on. And maybe a bit of landscape. There's a kind of background. I'll lighten it up a little bit. So this is or rather there's smoke coming out of here. So this is not exactly animation in the sense that these are additives there you, you add to a drawing so it's like those drawings that are done as you see the, the animation but there's more to it um, 
You can start doing that. I have no idea what will come out of this, but it's another experiment. Okay, let's see what happened here. Yeah. <laughs> so the smoke is moving. And you can have clouds, you can have a night falling, and uh, so much more. I think we can stop it here because I know we're, we're running out of time. But I thank you for having the patience to look <laughs> and follow. Uh, as much as you can uh, from some snippets from my my process I'm doing animation and um, I would kindly ask you if you want uh, I have a pack of cards there uh, and an envelope you can anonymously just leave your impressions some key words and put it in the envelope either now or a little later whenever you can, because it'll be a, a very good feedback for me. So this is it, as far as the demonstration part is concerned. And, uh, well, I'm looking forward to the next part now, <laughs> Anna. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh... All right, folks, so as, uh, as Ari mentioned, please feel free to write some comments or draw something as you wish on the cards he has left. And then we'll invite you to come back around to the other side of the space, uh, other side of the screen, I'm sorry, to, to make yourselves comfortable, have a seat. And then in a few minutes, we'll start our conversation between Ari and Janet. So those of you online, thanks so much again for your patience. Um, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you. Yes, I'll go wash my hands. Okay. <laughs> so hello everybody again and uh, thank you for being here and attending and for all those who are on the internet sphere and can follow this conversation that is about to begin. Today with me I have the pleasure to have Janet Bladder who's a PhD, uh, has a PhD from McGill in Integrated Studies from the Faculty of Education with a focus on cognitive sciences, science. And um, her specialization is visual design based problem solving, visual spatial and temporal reasoning and collaborative design. And more specifically, her research focuses on film animation, because Janet, you, you see film animation as being a very crucial area where one can study the temporal and spatial aspects, especially in the design process in the yeah. this problem solving. Right, yeah. exactly. exactly. And uh, also, you're a scholar in residence in the National Film Board of Canada. And uh, your publications and presentations at numerous film and interdisciplinary conferences uh, well, they push between the boundaries between the ideal, neat theoretical models and the messy world. 
uh, of real world animation design. And I think this, uh, if I can call it contradiction, although we have to come up with a better word <laughs> when we're talking about these two maybe opposite but friendly concepts or synergetic uh, concepts. Uh, and I know you look into the areas of cognition and of um, here, of course, you, you're, uh, you're, we're, we're, we're contrasting the, the perfect models uh, of uh, the theorists versus the messy world of the practice. Uh, but I find parallels between that and uh, our lives in general, it's a very broad concept that applies, I think, to animation, the way uh, I do animation, but also the things that I depict, but also, uh, and here I think is, is my, uh, my specialization or niche that I'm trying to explore, which is the way we make film animation and the way we, we represent this physical, um, atmospheric even, component of the city which machines probably cannot always grasp by themselves we we have an agency there uh, and I think we still do so uh, that that paradigm of ideations and practice mm -hmm. applies in my practice and I think in the in what I'm looking for and, and this is the reason why I really wanted to talk to you and have this conversation uh here uh we met in lisbon in 2019 in the society for animation uh conference and um well because of the pandemic we didn't have the chance to talk and i think this is a very good opportunity to have some exchange uh, i know i'm in the spotlight because it's my spotlight event but i want to shed some light also <laughs> throw it at you uh, and try to get some of your uh, experience in, in this matter, since you've spent decades doing this research. So the thing about cognition is that for me, it's not a, well, for a, a number of the cognitive scientists, it's not a left brain, right brain thing. It's not something that if you are creative, it's, you know, the right brain. And if you're logical, you're using your left brain. It's the kinds of things that you do. And just looking at the, your presentation, you, you'll go from your gut when you can, but you'll also stop going from your gut when you have a problem. Problem solving and problem finding is critical in what you're doing. And when you go into that mode, there is a logic behind it. It's a, it's, you can almost sense it. Um, but the other thing is that the m amount of time that it takes for you to draw something will differ when you have a problem or when you're just doing something that's simple for you. So I, I look at that, because that's where I go into more closely the nature of time and what does time mean? Um, there was a movie um, called The Core, Core. It's not an animated film, but there was a character in it who was, uh, kind of positioning himself against the scientist at the time. He was just a young geek. And the scientist was saying, why should I have you involved in this at all? You, I mean, I speak like 12 languages. What do you speak? And he said, I only speak one language. It's zero and one. I couldn't think as slow as you, even if I tried. My experience with animators is that they think at a speed um, that is faster than most of us. Oh, okay, I'll shout. So the, the, there is a definite temporality that you have to deal with in terms of the frames, in terms of what the viewer is going to see. There is an other temporality that you have to deal with in terms of the character's logic. If you're telling a narrative, any kind of narrative situation, whether it's people or whether it's trees, if there is a story behind it, it is what is the temporality of this movement versus this. And then there is the third is 
what the viewer is going to be seeing, how you want to depict that. So you as the animator, the vision of the, the perceptual perception of the viewer and the logic, in a, in a way, the motivation in this fictive world, you have to think about time in those three areas. And that's what, why I think that animation is probably one of the most difficult things to, to do. Yes, because uh, you, you somehow, um, well, you, you almost dissect time or you, 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 you extend it uh, and it, it, it's not, the, the, the time that one spends making these frames uh, or even shooting them is not synchronous with the the other end of where that animation will go exactly exactly that's the, that's the point which is the challenge and the beauty at the same time that's right it's the difficulty and that's where the splendor comes from that's that's where it is and you have to have that kind of I don't want to say mental um, acuity or that flexibility to be able to do that. That's not, scientists do that also. When they, when they are at creating something, they are at the same, that kind of thinking is not different depending on your field, except for the nature that you have to think about it in terms of a fictive world, in terms of what what is that world that's out there that you're presenting? And there's the time that is very valuable and it's not really visible. Not. Time is not maybe, well, maybe that a visible quality, but, but meaning that it's not something that people can appreciate um, or, or can perceive um, from the outside when seeing into the world of the animator and especially, uh, and the, in general, the artist, the, the time we, we need to spend away from practicing, uh, executing. Right. Um, I remember you telling me once about the, the valuable time uh, or, or the, 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 the conceptual, the time for conceiving right. things and how NFB animators would go back and here I'm bringing the issue of materiality in the paper. That's right. That's uh, right. How, how the, the, they may even start conceiving on a pad, uh, paper. Paper, you know, yeah. on, on, a, on a digital device, oh, right. Right. But, but then go back to paper because that's a time that they, they need and a space maybe that they need to there hasn't been neurologically too many, there I mean, hasn't I'm not been sure. too many studies on that i mean there were some studies on what paper affords as the term is uh, that it gives you a, a, a kind of a, a feedback not just visual but haptic uh the pressure the texture of a paper um gives you a kind of a feedback that working on a on a tablet does not so it's not just a perceptual thing. There, is an, there are different, different things that go into your thinking when you're going in, when you're using paper. Um, and my experience is that even the most digitally um, uh, expert uh, in most of the studios that I've actually done studies in, they'll start out by saying, we don't use paper, we, we don't have any paper around. And then they'll pause and they'll say, except when we have a problem. Mm. So these are really commercial and uh, very, very uh, expert animators, but they'll go to paper. And this is still happening now yes, because this is happening there's now. a lot of, yeah. well, I've, I've read papers and research papers, uh, they date to 2010, 2012, right. and you right. would say, well, yeah, but technology at that time was not as advanced and it wasn't so intuitive. And now people just use pads intuitively and it, it doesn't, it's so seamless. Um, I, I'm not, of course, of the, the newer generation, so it, I'm not sure if it's a generational um, thing, but, but, it, um, but as far as, uh, 
making animation by hand. There is that aspect of, I, I say it in simple terms, of fun. Yes. Which I was having here. Uh, only the fact that I was moving from one table to the other and going and clicking on the computer a bit, but, but, but the fact that I was in tune with the outside environment, um, that, that I think was something that I was willing to do for a much longer time. That's a very important element, having fun, especially in the beginning of something. It's a very important element because that's where you are. You're thinking, there is no box yet. You haven't created the box. So you're thinking, to say that you're thinking out of the box is really a misnomer when you're doing that kind of creativity, that kind of play. Uh, that's what it goes back to. It's the notion of play. and. All of the work <clears throat> that I've read on design, the, they point out that the original stages in the entire process, the longest will take place in the earliest stage because it's the lowest risk. Mm. So having fun and just playing with ideas is what's going to create this enormous multi-million or billion dollar production or something that's very close to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. The <clears throat> and I mean, I, I quoted before uh, people who, who work with me know this and from conferences um, because I wanted to base my research on existing architectural research. And um, there is this scholar, uh, Yuhani Palazma from Helsinki, who has said the same thing about architecture, about uh, the conceptual stage being um, a place in which architects still prefer to sketch. Uh, and I think the low risk factor has to do with that very coveted freedom. <laughs> but it, it's a very interesting thing because when you are in that original stage, you are still in control. As you get more and more of the animation being at a, at a higher level where you are now in the, I don't know, the <clears throat> production stage and then the post-production stage, the product that you are doing, the film that you're doing takes over and you have to, in the beginning your early sketches work for you and then you get to a certain point where you are working for it. You no mm -hmm. longer or the focus of it. It's the work itself, because it has to survive without you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, <clears throat> the, the, the amount of technology comes with all these parameters, um, well, pre-designed pre by others as to what mm -hmm. one can or cannot do and of course we, we play with those and of course when we draw and we cut and we do things with our hand we have many limitations and again the limitations are what uh, you know the, yeah, there's the beauty in that because right. because there, there's the economy of, of making things uh, tell more than they would mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time um, as you said I think the lines of the box are a little bit more dashed right. uh, in that stage, whereas, whereas towards the end, uh, it's very specific, and you have to play with those specific parameters. You can, you can come up with some ideas uh, and, and make alterations, mm -hmm. but as you said, it's, it's the... The, the percentage of movement, I guess, is it's very limited. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And if you're working on something that's on a commercial or even an independent level, you have X amount of dollars and X amount of time. So it's not, it, th there was this uh, saying, you know, if you give, this was before computers, if you give a, th a hundred monkeys a hundred years, they'll come out with a Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. you know, product. 
um, you have these resources, resources, but they're limited. You mm. don't have endless time to work on something. You don't have endless amount of money. So you have to know how to position the entire project in such a way where you, you, you have, a, it's called a least commitment mode in the beginning where you can play and do whatever because you're not that committed. The expense hasn't gone in there, so. And would you think that the, the viewer senses that? The viewer doesn't see, doesn't see that. The viewer sees the end product. The viewer doesn't see how much, how many years were spent in the making of this film. When they say the making of this film, it starts before you pick up, sometimes it starts before you pick up the pencil. It started, you know, it started years ago, possibly. It started when you were just finishing off your previous project. Um, it could take years to develop something conceptually before you start working on it. Once you start working on it, you still have a give it and take between your style and your composition and what you are actually putting down and the story. It's still a give and take, but as you get further along on the process, there's less of a give and take because you are fixed you're fixed to, you have a commitment. Mm. I was wondering whether the viewer senses any of the fun or any of the, well, it, the spontaneity. I know the word is, is uh, now may, may, may be uh, misunderstood because there may be a level of spontaneity in any medium that we use um, or, or that sense of, well, plainly the touch uh, when I do something with charcoal and I leave my my fingerprints and, and that of course has some kind of aesthetic but also some sensorial quality uh, that the viewer the view uh, there, Paul Wells I believe uh, animator scholar has written something about the indexality or the index um, and, and how uh, it, it, how, how people can recognize sometimes ordinary objects. That's a different story, of course, yeah, when you have yeah. ordinary objects being in stop motion animation versus uh, a, a drawn line. Uh, but then even there, you may see the drawn line and recognize it as such, that that's a, that's a drawn line. Yeah, so I think if you are an animator or a filmmaker, and and if the final animation is on paper and you could see the texture and you can see the line itself, I think viewers re will, will relate to what they're seeing on a deeper level. So I know it seems contradictory that if you are an expert, you're not seeing the film the way most other people see it but I think other people can pick up on that if, it's, if that's part of what you want to show. That's what people have confessed uh, over and over in, in some of the films that have shown them. Uh, they have recognized that aspect and they find it, I don't know, I would say it, it captures their interest. It's kind of like watching, it's like kind of a, like seeing, like just your, just your, you know, your talk, your demonstration over here. It's like watching a mag magician reveal the secrets to you. I felt and like a magician at some point. It's true. <laughs> 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 because the, the yeah. pauses uh, and, and all these, uh, well, uh, there, there was a, I had the sense that I was, I was hiding something from other people, that I was going to reveal something, uh, that I was going to surprise them, pretending that I don't know. But it's true that I did not know. <laughs> but that's part, but we don't know. There's nobody who, I mean, I vote that's one of these contradictions that, that, you know, that I'm, I'm struck with is how you are very humble about what you're doing and saying, I don't know, I don't know where this is going. 
um, but you do it anyway. You have that strength to do it anyway, not to give up. Yes, um, and and you know how there's that saying that if you love your uh, medium or your art, um, you're like the violin player who has to have his violin under the pillow and sleep mm -hmm. with it all the time. And I think that's one of my challenges that maybe because I, 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 I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, well, good it, luck sleeping with the computer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, or the light table, yeah. or sleeping on the light table. <laughs> Uh, but all this to say that the, um, the the commitment or the taking charge of these projects because animation is so labor intensive and there's there's a commitment beyond the sketch so uh, mm -hmm. yes a sketch is, is something that you do for the moment That's but true. when you decide to start exactly. place cutting things placing them organizing them in a story and 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 the execution itself uh as people probably got a um an idea um in, in, in which i did in, in the most rough way possible but if i was to to be a bit more meticulous about it um it, it's a big deal so so it takes it, it takes that discipline to 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 persist uh and and, and i i say discipline with courage but they're not contradictions. No. I think it's the same kind of, uh, like to have the courage to be disciplined. That's right. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking about, and this goes to your animation and your history of, from architecture, um, what did your background in architecture, do you think gave you that benefits you as an animator? Yeah, yeah that's very, a large part of who I am and what I do and uh, well at a very first level is the appreciation of the built environment and the understanding of how uh, architecture affects the way we live the meanings that we find in our lives every day um, the and the quality of life and the and you can you can even go further and and say the uh, the senses that we that we experience in a, in a in every city is different and and sometimes we don't even have words to explain what is different about this city and 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 we do try to express but it's never easy to express I think it's almost impossible to express exactly what it is about a certain place or what it is about a certain city. Uh, so, so these are all things that I had in mind as an architect all the time. And uh, architecture as a study has been a very disciplining <laughs> or very um, detail-oriented work that went against the grain of my personality at the beginning. I think I had to become more disciplined uh and and and, and detail oriented in in some aspects i'm not saying that i'm not detail oriented in everything but, but i think in in some aspects that, that definitely help. and the problem solving that you mentioned before is something that uh, most people who finish architecture are drilled into um novel problems all the time new parameters new problems new solutions all the time there is a tendency to think you're going to reinvent the wheel all the time which i don't agree with <laughs> uh or, or the the sake of doing something because it was never done before which i'm also skeptical about it's too extreme yeah um and um both architecture, most people might not see that as evident, but, but architecture is temporal, not as designing maybe, but itself as object and as experience. And we live uh, 
in, 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 we live in the buildings, we experience them, we move in the buildings in, a different, in different ways, different speeds, different, uh, there's so, so much that the linear technical drawing cannot express. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my frustrations was that distance between the, this type of architectural drawing and the outcome, mm -hmm. and also the, the limitations of the requirements of building, which uh, alter the, the pure ideas that one can have. When I say pure ideas, I mean uh, pure ideas of um, a, 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 about, about that, that I think animation allowed me eventually to express stories about architecture, uh, that, that element that I wasn't able to, and maybe animation is a medium par excellence to express mm -hmm. animation in the end that may be incorporated, and I think it does already in architecture schools. Film has been employed mm -hmm. uh, more and more. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but, but, but I think going to animation for me was also a step towards uh, a more innocent place where I can, be more free to 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 think about spaces that don't have the constraints of technicalities but try to somehow talk about the essence of place as a human experience so your work it just dawned on me while you were talking it just just hit me um how your your work and, and goes into this group of work where the animator is actually a philosopher um, and coming out with philosophical definitions, and I'm using the term definition very broadly, on essential concepts that people are still trying to grapple with. Time is one of them. We don't know what time is definitively, either from a scientific point of view or a perceptual point of view, it's a very, very ambiguous term that we all seem to know what it is, but there isn't one overarching, this is what time is, either in terms of temporal duration or temp temporal sequencing. Um, can we think about time without an object being there, for example? All of those issues that I'm playing around with, you know, as a scientist, I'm realizing that there are animation can actually help you question those or inspire questioning the essence of what what temporality really means. Mm. So thank you for making my life more difficult. That's, that's well, that's, that's, that's my job. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's mutual. Um, it, well, yeah, and, and, and time, and um, and I think also the the perception of time as as something that has taken um, has has worn a surface, has war, or or has. Um, you know, can, can be read in, 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 in the things that we animate or in the cities that we live in, um, what we call patina of time, but it could be also just the, the, the consciousness of, of past life and past people. And, and that's, that's also a time which, which I think in, in the handmade medium somehow it, it tries it, well it evokes it it evokes it in, in, a, in a certain way because the, the there's that m mortality of, of the well of the of the physical things that we use or, or if not mortality i would call it yeah. better uh, you know the the decay you could you could you could decide to either emphasize emphasize that in an animation or extinguish that in an animation and you are you are actually exposing it and bringing that out it's, um, but um so you use the computer you're using dragon um how do you view 
where we're heading, like with AI. Mm -hmm. How does, have you thought how that would impact you as an animator? Yeah, I somehow avoid the whole discourse because I, and, and you might scold me for this, <laughs> but I, um, I'm resistant to, to, to this type of, let's say, progress, but maybe that's just out of fear or, or just uh, of what I, what, I, what I value or what I, what I choose. I, I, think, I think technology is something that opens possibilities, and every time I see a possibility that can enhance mm -hmm. what I already do, of course, uh, it's something that I want to try, but at the same time, um, I, I, I don't think it should be an inevitable or in an, an inevitability uh, that, that, that technology, for example, that the technology is, is some kind of being that has a life in its own and it's just going and we have to follow it somehow we, we must have some kind of control over that technology and, and having technology taking over may uh, add all kinds of conveniences in our lives. Uh, we can have um, a very highly technological environment where life is easier, but I'm always thinking whether life, when it's, it, whether, whether it's best to have an easier life. I'm not even sure if that's something that I want. Um, because usually um, what, what is convenient is not always meaningful to me. And um, the, these, these struggles or this messiness that you were referring before or these inconvenient situations that allow for all kinds of um, spontaneous but also hazardous or, or um, unpredictable situations that the city can offer uh, well that that's something that I want to live with mm -hmm. and I as I want to live with all the risks or the open-ended uh, well you said low risk but I mean the yeah. the, the, the the realm of possibilities of of, uh, of these handmade techniques which of course um, yeah AI can do miracles but but it's not really where when I say miracles in terms of, of uh, executing um, hyper realistic uh, maybe animation or simulating realities that uh, we can live um, but but um, in the end I'm not sure if that's something that we want or or if it's something that um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing still to abandon uh, and I think that's why I called this uh, uh, talk uh, "While the City Still Breathes," <laughs> because I am, I'm almost afraid that it's it's not going to be breathing, <laughs> and that's yeah. It also dawns on me, looking at your work, um, there's something that you're learning from actually doing all of this. I mean, yes, you could feed this into, or maybe it will be Chat GPT five, not four, as we have but maybe chat GPT-5 will have the animation where you know, you'll put in your, um, your code and out will turn the animation. Um, when you are doing your work, you're learning something. It gets passed forward to your next animation. I don't know whether that's going to happen if you can just code a computer to come out with something and then just give it you know, to the producer, the producer will have it done, and mm -hmm, that's it. Mm -hmm. Even if it is the best thing on the planet, the the idea is you're not going to be learning. Mm -hmm. There is something about that play in the beginning, and the problems that you have to find, and the problems that you have to solve, which is encouraging you to do better on the next one. Even if the even if the first one was actually brilliant, the better is a very internal, it's an internal feeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's cumulative. Yeah. Um, and it's, 
it's something that it's as cumulative as the traces on you know in in, in the, you know I, I try to make the the parallel between the, the physicality or the humanity of of uh, making things by hand and I know it's not completely handmade it's a there's a hybrid component uh, it's a, there's a technological or digital component which is you know the, the hybridity um, but but I'm, I'm, I'm constantly seeing uh, fit, you know, just as in the early 20th century, cinema was seen to be a, an ideal medium to express the modern city. Uh, well, the, the same way uh, animation uh, is an ideal medium, I guess, to express not only the city, but, but that tactile aspect of right. the city. And I know that uh, when I say handmade animation, it's not exclusively handmade, it, there's a, but there's an important handmade component. and. I'm, I'm looking into ways into which this uh, handmade component can make us appreciate perhaps the, 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 well, the built environment, the city in, in a way that CGI, you know, or, or other very uh, evolved technologies miss. Uh, so, and, and the, I guess they can complement each other. I mean, every, every medium or, or technology has its place um, but I, but I think with the with the advent of of um, some software that has uh, facilitated the those handmade techniques uh, I think they're very relevant still um, and um, yeah I'm looking into these ways of communicating that tactility or that that um, that human aspect, or that that um, th those aspects of the city that that uh, are more uh, well, that have to do with with uh, with the lived experience. So that leads me to another question: on how do you understand the real, the physical object um, versus the abstract in your in your yeah again another of those seeming contradictions um it's um well the even though uh there is a certain reality or a certain uh well the the, the the tactility and the real objects that i use mm -hmm. are more real if if I'm allowed to say that, then then the virtual reality, or at least they're not virtual, they're real, real. There is also um, the possibility of of abstraction. So so the reality refers to the material, mm -hmm. or that indexical, um, mm -hmm. you know, viewing uh, or understanding of, of these objects. But then, at the same time, uh, because they they may there, there's that open box, as you said before. Uh, I think it, it, they tell us more than what they are. Uh, they 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 don't try to be something specific. Uh, they they have that they're abstract enough in their own way to to allow for our imagination to. Uh, to perceive, uh, you know, a, a greater breadth of of uh, of, 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 of um, you know area of meaning. So um, that goes into the idea of abstraction itself. I mean, very starting when we're very young we begin to have this notion of pareidolia, where we can find. We can look at a um, an electric outlet and see a face in it. We can find faces in the most abstract situations. We can see faces. The moon has a face. Mm -hmm. um, we children who are very young can watch cartoons that are very abstract. Um, I'm not talking about the 3D cartoons that they can see now, but 
you know, just the, the outline, outline of two dots and a, you know, and a curve. And yeah. the, um, that idea of this abstraction is part of, I think, of what, of what all animation has. Even if it's 3D, there is something about, yes, you know, when you're watching The Lion King, I was watching it with my husband and he insisted that it was live action. That it wasn't, yeah, he didn't, he didn't figure it out. And certainly when you're watching nowadays, if you're watching any action movie, a good percentage of it is animation. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the idea of, of abstraction itself, I don't, I don't see it necessarily being extinguished because we can have more and more tools in making something that's abstract look realistic. I think there is something about thinking with abstract objects which is so embedded in us that I don't, I honestly don't believe that that's going to mm -hmm. be extinguished. What do you, what do you think? Do you think we're going to be doing away with that or? No, I don't think so. It's just that the, the handmade materials and their abstraction, mm -hmm. um, deal with that contradiction between the the perception of the real and also the the openness of imagining mm -hmm. things that the you know the, the somehow the the the, the hand drawn or the the hand cut um I'll, it's a statement in itself and it tells you that there's definitely something beyond it Absolutely. It's sometimes it's indexed to something else, but sometimes when I watch an abstract film or when I'm po focusing just on the ind like independent animation that's entirely abstract, it's I begin to find I begin to invent a kind of a story in my head, not a hero kind of story, but just a kind of a narrative for me to articulate what I'm seeing. Mm. So when I watch, for example, Norman McLaren's uh, um, works, um, especially um, be, like Be Gone, Dull Care, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, the, um, the imagery was so hypnotic and I just kept watching how things were moving and I was saying to myself, so this moves here, this moves here, this moves here, this moves here. This moves here. So I was kind of inventing a, a narrative to it. And I just wonder whether you as an animator ever do that, where you can actually do something that's abstract, but you see it almost as a narrative. I'm putting this here, this here, this, here, this here, so that you are understanding your process differently. Um, you were doing that actually when you were doing the um, the man walking. Yes. That's that's what you were actually. I was I was struck by that. Yes. Um, because it was it was um, it was um, forward. Mm -hmm. You know, you were mm -hmm. doing it mm -hmm. in a, you know as a straight line, mm -hmm. not a straight line. Um, There's an undulating. Yeah. Movement, but you went the undulating afterwards. You realized that going on a straight line wasn't. But I meant a, a forward animation instead of going from the beginning to the middle and then the middle to the end. You know, doing th a three phase kind of. You went straight ahead. It was a straight ahead animation. Ah yes, I didn't do. Um, I didn't fill in yeah, the in betweens. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, because then I would have to be um, well more scientific with my time. Okay, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and um, there's yeah. there's that daring uh, of taking the step and, and doing uh, something from 
well, from experience a little bit too. So, so it becomes a little bit like riding a bicycle and, and like breathing or like being, you know, th th this is something that I am attracted to in the, in this process. It, 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 it basically goes against all the things I, I was supposed to know or learn, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, it, it's, it's, uh, I just don't want to give up being um, there, there's an element of freedom that I don't want to give up um, and and uh, I think that the imperfections that are bound with this are something that are understood and perceived in a positive way. Are we uh, extending beyond our time? Oh, hi, Ari. Yes. Hi, Janet. <laughs> I'm just uh, popping in to say that because I know you wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions and comments and uh, we're just nearing six o'clock now. So I didn't okay. know if somebody in yes. in the yes. space or on okay. Zoom Open had anything up. they wanted to share before we close up? Thank you. Yes. Yes, please. Well, we'll just get a microphone to you. Just a second, please. Sorry. The microphone is not working. Check. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It's working. Okay. Hi there. Uh, so, um, so I kind of have a similar trajectory to yours. I, I was originally trained in landscape architecture, and I got into the film animation program at Concordia, and I'm in the MFA right now. And um, I was just curious, like, uh, like what was that transition from architecture to film animation like? What drew you to film animation in the first place? Um, and yeah, just general. <laughs> Yeah, so I think if whatever I answer, you may relate. <laughs> so uh, I, it was a, first of all, I have to make it clear, it was a childhood dream. Um, but there was this idea that architecture is a much more stable profession. <laughs> Whoever had that thought, I don't know. Uh, but, but it ended up being, um, of course, an area which was, uh, as I was saying before, an exercise in problem solving, creativity uh, up to an extent, and uh, a cultural education. So that that definitely something that I never regret. And of course, uh, the transition was not abrupt. It was a very gradual one. Well, abrupt it was, but it, it took me many years to come to that cour courageous moment <laughs> uh, and be honest with myself and say, what do I really want to do? Uh, but then, you know, you can leave architecture, but architecture will never leave you. And um, I soon realized that everything I did had something architectural, let's say, about it. Um, and also, I had things to say. So what, what the, 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 the real motivation, and, and uh, correct me, or, or uh, you can add to this if you, if you don't, if you, 
if you because you, you may have the same reasoning uh was that in the architecture offices where i used to work i was just uh, a cog in a big machine and i wasn't very ambitious to be at the very top of the pyramid and have my own architecture office so it seemed that i was spending a lot of time drawing straight lines doing a lot of copy pasting doing a lot of things which were not as creative and the creative aspects of an architecture office also the the the, the portion is not as much as we think so he, uh, what I really wanted was to be able to have full control over my work, be the author of this work, and have not that animation cannot be a, a, a large studio where you still are a cog in a machine, but there was that possibility to do a two minute, three minute animated film and tell my story. And boy, did I have stories to say on the built environment and the cities that we live in. So I think that was, yeah, but the transition was uh, was an interesting one because uh, a lot of the things that I thought wouldn't apply did apply, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, like hundred percent. Like I, I felt a lot of the same things. Like in an architecture office, like there's only maybe five percent area for creativity, and the rest is all technical. And um, in terms of the actual films, like I I noticed that you work on a very like mass level um you're not exactly following characters specific characters but you're it's a very like bird's eye kind of view uh like do you see yourself continuing in that uh do you see yourself um maybe zeroing in on specific stories yeah. or like what's your relationship yeah, yeah. With that? that's a good question i um I'm, even in films that i like i think they're films that are about settings the setup, the 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 cityscape, the atmosphere, um, and characters a little bit secondary. And I think, well, there, there's there there are characters, there are figures, uh, but but zooming into specific emotions of people. So far, I haven't had that uh, impulse. It's, it's more. It's more about um, creating emotions in a in a different way. Uh, ha having having the uh, immersing the viewer into places. I would say, yeah, I think that's that's a motivation right there. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm not seeing any questions or comments online, but maybe somebody else in the space has a final word. May I ask a question? Uh, thank you both. You were talking about the perception of time and also its relationship to animation and built environment. And as we know, everybody in different situations and while doing different activities, they perceive time differently and how much uh, you see time as a political factor in the built environments and uh, how different ways of measuring time or experiencing and time can bring freedom for different individuals in the built environments thank you mo so um the 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 message thanks for that question is going to help me articulate something that's very hard. Um, the methods that I use, the context of, uh, of my work comes from cultural historical activity theory. Oh, okay. Okay. So the question that you're asking about the, the, the cultural and the historical, um, uh, constraints, and affordances that go into creating a film um, on many different levels and on how it's going to be perceived by a certain society at this moment in time is something that I look at. That's exactly what I look at. I didn't present it over here, but that's 
that goes into the idea of how is time understood and where does that understanding come from? Is it something that's imposed or is it something that's innate? If it's innate, is it a, what I'm seeing is something that's more emergent. It's not from the top down, which is what cultural historical activity theory stipulates is that it's a top down thing going from society to the individual. And I see it more emergent. And so I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's what I see. Yeah, I can add to this from the well, from the animator's perspective. Um, I, I make, whether I want it or not, a political statement when I'm representing the city. And I'm definitely aware that I'm representing it from my own point of view. Uh, I could be a person living in Montreal in a different neighborhood under different circumstances, and my perception of time would be very different, and the stories I would tell would be different, meaning even in, in terms of their time. Uh, and and um, So I think that's why it's always good for artists to be in tune with other well, with the rest of the city and the citizens to, to somehow incorporate that sensi sensibility in, in our work as much as possible. Is there anyone else who wanted to jump in? And, and if that's not the case, then uh, perhaps uh, Ari and Janet, I'll pass it to you for some uh, final words, if you have any final reflections you'd like to make today. Well, Janet, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, it, it triggers me to think, um, you know, my work in terms of, uh, well, what, what it, um, well, how can, how can research more, uh, not only the built environment, but the, the elements that I'm putting into my work, where they come from and, and how these are transmitted and, and, and what would be an effective way to communicate architecture in, in, in my case, it's not something, well, it, it, it is something that, that comes from my experiences, but it also uh, the, the the way the way and the method of, of work is, is really a big part of, of well your research as well, uh, and um, not to become too self conscious about it, but I think I think it is is uh, is good to recognize it and start looking at you know different ways of doing things when 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 representing the city. Or the the architecture and that relationship between the visible and the material stuff that are behind before the camera captures it and that that's something that i would like viewers to be more aware of from, from my point of view um, as a cognitive scientist i was asked whether i want to write something that's aimed at animators to teach animators something about cognitive issues the way I the way I you know, I practice cognitive science but I don't think animators have to learn from me I think cognitive scientists have to learn from you on how to rethink what are what are central issues in cognitive science I think you're pushing you're pushing me in, and I'm saying this in a positive sense, to think about things on levels that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have otherwise. So I think everybody over here, and, and certainly my conversations with you, have taught me more about how to think about cognitive science rather than teaching animators on, on how to, you know, how to do their job. Thank you for appreciating that, and I. I promise that this is the beginning of a longer conversation. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you both so much. A round of applause, folks.
Thank you. Thank you. And and thank you. Thanks everybody who's here, and thanks to you, Anna, and all the team that has been very collaborative in putting this together. Some of it last minute. <laughs> it's our, it's our, it's what that was we love my to fault. Do. Thank you. <laughs> it's our pleasure. And of course, the Public Scholars Pro Program. Amazing. Which gives yes, me and the you, platform. You had some supporters in here, Ari, in the, in the Zoom as well. Just pointing that out. Thanks to you, folks. Uh, we will be closing up the Zoom now, uh, reminding you that. You can revisit this conversation and workshop on our YouTube channel. Check out Concordia University Sports Space to find it there. And we appreciate you taking the time to come in person or online to join this conversation. Thanks, everybody. Until next time. Ciao.